stream. We are dreamed into existence. What we do with that dream is up to us. This is Stream. I am Jessica Deruta, and I share with you my stream of consciousness. You may find Stream on my blog at TrustPsyche.com and on my YouTube channel, Jessica Deruta. Please take what serves you and leave the rest. Let us begin. How we dream is as important as what we dream, for the what of the dream knows itself through the how. Welcome to Stream 8, the Trust Psyche Astrology and Psychology Podcast. This is a very special stream. The topic for today is personal transits. And it's special for two reasons. First is that it's more technically oriented. So we're going to be going through the step-by-step process on how to calculate and follow your personal transits. And within that technique, um, we are going to be looking at how to grasp the spiritual significance of the technique itself. For me, this is an example of structural poetics in that we see the poetic nature of the structure of the way that personal transits work from the orbs of influence that I use to how I see the timing of the transit speaking to different stages of our development. For me, everything astronomical in astrology has a spiritual significance to it. For example, the fact that Mercury goes retrograde three times a year for three weeks at a time, that's a structure of the way that our solar system is set up. It's part of the cosmic clock. And just like the cosmic clock shows the cosmic rhythms and our biological clock show our biorhythms, there is meaning, there's intelligence, there's significance to why this is set up in this way. So this is an astronomical event. However, it has spiritual significance. And for me, this is part of structural poetics, that the structure of the solar system, the structure of astronomy and how it works is speaking to us in a poetic or symbolic nature. This is also a special stream because it is part of my online astrology course, Deepen Your Astrological Practice, which you can begin right now at trustpsyche.com. Deepen Your Astrological Practice is open to all levels from beginners to advanced astrologers or lovers of astrology. It's a course that really is the culmination of my last decade of work as an astrologer and psychotherapist. And the course Uh, ended up being over 60 hours of material. Over 50 people collaborated to make and produce the content of the course. It's a special course because not only is it um, 45 hours of me teaching, but we also had 10 guest speakers and dozens of um, musicians and artists and astrologers coming together to produce original work, dance, music, video. And so what we did in this course is we went through the 45 archetypal combinations or planetary pairs and from the sun and the moon all the way out to Neptune and Pluto. So when you take the sun and the moon and the other eight planets in our solar system, you get these 45 pairs, these 45 different archetypal universes um, where, uh, For each one, there was uh, original music and paintings and dance that were created to go into that archetypal universe or into that realm. And so this course really is about an embodied intuitive knowing of how to enter into the archetypal combinations or the archetypal complexes. You can see the trailer for Deep in Your Astrological Practice as well at trustpsyche.com. I'd love for you to check it out. I'd love for you to join us. 
Um, it really is my greatest contribution to astrology thus far, and I would absolutely love for you to come on the journey. So this stream is part of the Sun Mars section in the course. Uh, each week there's supporting material with uh, guided meditations, experiential exercises, um, uh, writing prompts, all kinds of things, including this stream, which is one of the only strictly technical parts of the course where we're really just going into, all right, how do you do personal transits? the majority of the course is really focusing on the meaning or the interpretation of the planets and the planets in relationship or aspect with one another. Also stream can now be found on iTunes, Spotify, Google play, and of course the trust psyche YouTube channel. I'd love for you to follow us on all those platforms and subscribe to like share and comment with your friends. It means the world to us here at trust psyche as a grassroots astrology community for you to uh, participate and join the conversation. We'd also like to invite you over to like the Trust Psyche Facebook page and to join the Trust Psyche Astrology group and come be a part of the ongoing astrological and psychological dialogue that's ha happening over there. So we're gonna begin now by going into personal transits and the technique. If you're listening to this without the visual aid, um, you might want to hop on over to YouTube and find us there at the Trust Psyche channel if you want a visual of mapping out the chart and transits that I'm about to go into. So I'm really going to be transparent here in this process. It's going to be a real-time, step-by-step process and how we do personal tran transits. So let's begin. I am going to now share my screen with you and I'm going to pull up Travis DeRuza's birth chart. Travis has uh, allowed me to use his chart as an example for calculating personal transits. So the first step that I do when I'm doing personal transits for myself or for a client is I pull up the natal chart and I take it in. So I first see Travis is born on June 22nd, 1982 at 12, 18 PM in Beaver, Pennsylvania. And I calculate very quickly, 1982, okay, Travis is 36 years old. I look and I see that Travis is born here with the sun at zero degrees Cancer in a conjunction with the moon. So he's a new moon in Cancer with the North Node. I see that the sun is in a 120 degree trine to Jupiter down here at zero Scorpio and uh, with Pluto at 24 Libra. I also see that the sun is in an 180 degree opposition to Neptune at 25 Sag. And then I see that the sun is in a square with Mars at nine Libra. I also see that the moon at 17 degrees Cancer is in a square to Mars in Libra, and that Mars is squaring the midpoint of the sun and the moon. So it really makes Travis a sun, moon, Mars person. Um, that nine degree square is within the orb of influence that I would use for a natal chart for a square, which is around up to 10 degrees. However, with that midpoint, it really tightens that aspect. I also see here that the moon at 17 Cancer is square to Saturn at 15 Libra. So it's a tight aspect that Travis carries. And then he also has the moon in a square to Pluto. I see that uh, I take in that Travis is born with 17 degrees Virgo rising. The midheaven is Gemini and Mercury is conjunct the midheaven in the ninth house. It's in a wide conjunction with Venus and Chiron and the Chiron, Venus, Mercury, Stellium in the ninth house is all opposite Uranus at one degree Sagittarius. Lastly, I take in that uh, there is a yod happening here, two quincunxes and a sextile. So Pluto, really the Jupiter Pluto, but Pluto is quincunx, 150 degrees, a minor aspect to Venus and Chiron at 26 and 25 Taurus respectively, and that those two planets are also in 150 degree yod to Neptune at 25 Sag, and then Neptune is in a 60 degree sextile with Pluto. 
at 24 Libra. So I know that I'm throwing around a lot of numbers here, but I am letting you into the process of how I take in a birth chart when I'm comprehending the major archetypal configurations, the planetary aspects that a person is born with. And I want that to soak into my being. I want it to be imprinted in my psyche so that when I go to look at the personal transits, where the world, where the world transits are right now, the planets in the sky right now, in relationship to Travis's birth chart, it helps me understand the chart from a more integrated position, a more holistic position, or what I call a systems view of the chart, where I'm not seeing the chart or the planets as these separate points, the sun being separate from the moon. Travis is a sun, moon, new moon baby. Um, Travis is a sun, Neptune opposition. These are archetypal signatures or complexes that Travis will live with his entire life. And so when Travis gets a transit to, let's say, the sun, I know that it's really activating his sun, Neptune, and that every time he goes through a transit, the sun gets hit first and then the moon. And this helps us understand the unfolding story. It gives us more of the nuance of the details of the qualities of the experience that Travis is having. And again, to come back to structural poetics, that there's a spiritual significance um, not only in the technique, but in, in the astronomy and in the, the placement of the planets, that I know that Travis will always get an aspect of a transit to his sun before his moon. And that is significant. That means that um, first, transit, uh, Travis does work on the self, his identity, his individual ego, his creativity, the sun. And then it moves to the moon, the family, the home, his relationships, his feelings and his, his emotions and his um, inner psyche. We want to pay attention to these things because it helps cue us into the way that an individual person develops. Our personal transits are the ways that we psychologically learn and grow. It's the ways we individuate. It's the ways that we see ourselves not only embedded in this place, but the process through which we move through life. Our transits activate and catalyze the innate potential of the birth chart in the cosmic dance of this relationship between the self and the universe, the self and the world, the self and the cosmos. And the personal transits give us a sense of the timing. And this is also where structural poetics is relevant, is that the timing of the transits that we go through in our life are set in motion um, at the moment of our birth. So not only does our birth chart represent this kind of cosmic blueprint or window into our soul, it shows us our karma. It shows us the unresolved issues and wounds that we're bringing into this life. It shows us our soul's evolutionary intent. It shows us our life's mission. It shows us our gifts and our challenges, our personality, the ways that we are in relationship, our vocation. It shows us so much. And what's set at the moment that the birth chart is set which we know is stationary and, and doesn't move, is that the timing of the transits that we go to, whether we go through transiting Pluto, conjunct the sun at age 5, 25, 50, 75, or never, has karmic significance in our life, that that is set up as in part of the accord of our development. So not only do I believe that our birth chart is chosen from our higher self before we incarnate into this physical realm of earth, but that the timing of our transits or the timing of our significant life events, our karmic unfolding story is also chosen. And so this is why the timing of personal transits has a structural poetics to it as well. Okay. <clears throat> so let's move into looking at Travis's personal transits and I'll take you through the step-by-step -step process that I use to understanding that. So as we know, Travis's natal chart is in the inner wheel and then the personal transits is on the outer wheel. So where the planets are right now on March 9th, 2019 is on the outer wheel in relationship to the inner wheel. You'll see here that I'm using uh, the app Astro Gold. It's an affordable app. It's pretty clean. If you have an iPhone, I think you can get it for $10. If you have a Mac, you can get it for like $100. 
Um, I also use Solar Fire, which I absolutely love. It's a more expensive and it's a little bit more complex. Um, I think sometimes it has more uses than the average person would need, but I think for people who are seriously devoted to astrology, it can be a really wonderful um, application to use. So anyways, this is Astro Gold, and you can see that in the inner wheel, I don't show the um, lines of the aspects because I think it's important for us as astrologers to not rely on that. Early on in our practice, it's wonderful. We need those visualizations to help us see the relationships of the opposition and the square and the trine and the sextile. But really, uh, as we grow and develop, we want to understand and how to see those aspects in our own mind without having to rely on the lines themselves. So it's not here, and so I'll be able to point those out for you, and for those of you who might be newer to this practice. Okay. So what I do is I always work my way from the outermost planet in. And when we're looking at mapping out personal transits for a given year, um, we're always focusing on Pluto, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter. The inner planets are moving so quickly that we can only calculate those for days or weeks at a time, uh, not months and years. And when I'm writing out transits for clients, I'm writing them out for Pluto through Saturn and sometimes Jupiter, and I'm doing it for the current year that we're in. So in this case would be 2019. And then I usually do it for about the next five years so that we can really get a sense of the evolutionary arc of where this person is heading in the quality and the timing of their life. What kind of energies are they going to be really working on and how can we see the sequential unfolding of the transits as an unfolding narrative arc. Again, there's a, there's a reason, there's a purpose and intelligence in the order in which we receive our personal transits. That's not an accident. That's not random. It's as much, it carries as much meaning and purpose in it as the placement of the planets in our birth chart. So what I would do first is I would look at Pluto here, which is uh, currently at um, 22 degrees of Capricorn. And what I'm doing is I'm actually taking in, just like I took in the birth chart, the placement of the world transits. And I'm going to just do that roughly here, but I would look at the uh, world transits separately just so I can really make sure that I understand that Saturn and Pluto are in a four degree conjunction right now. I know that they've been conjunct from approximately February of 2018, and it's going to go through the end of 2022. They're really tight right now. They're within four degrees. So this is a field of energy. It's an archetypal complex. Uh, right now, Pluto and Saturn are together in Capricorn. So really, it's a Saturn-Pluto time period, a Saturn-Pluto epoch. And everybody born during this time is going to be born with the generational aspect configuration of Saturn-Pluto. I also know that Pluto is square Uranus. It has been since 2007. It's going to go to about 2020. We're coming near the end of that. It's in an eight degree square right now. And then what this means is, is that uh, pretty soon here, Saturn and Uranus are also gonna be square one another. I also see that Neptune is at 16 degrees Pisces, which is in a 90 degree square to Jupiter at 22 Sag. All of 2019 is a Jupiter square Neptune year. So I wanna take that in as well. That covers the significant outer planet alignments that are happening in the world transits right now. And that's all we're really uh, needing to focus on when we're looking at personal transits for, again, the scope of time of months and years, which is what we're doing here. So the first place I begin is with Pluto. And I want to look at all of the major aspects that Pluto is making to the natal chart. I'm going to focus here on the five major aspects, the conjunction, opposition, square, trine, and sextile. So the first thing I noticed is that Pluto has been opposite Travis's natal moon at 17 Cancer. And I see that Pluto has also been square Travis's natal Saturn at 15 Libra. Again, because Travis is born with moon square Saturn, that whole um, complex has been being transited by Pluto and will continue to do so for um, a little while longer. I also see that Pluto is in its square to Travis's natal Pluto. I mentioned earlier that Travis is 36. 
what I'm calculating there when I see that age is I instantly know that he is uh, has entered his midlife transits, which are universal transits that every person goes through around the ages of 35 to 45. It's a significant turning point in our development as human beings, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. And in this case, Pluto square Pluto is one of those midlife transits. So is Neptune square Neptune, which hasn't quite begun yet. Uh, Saturn square Saturn, um, which is the first Saturn alignment um, after the Saturn return that happens as another universal transit for everyone between approximately the ages of 28 and 31. Um, really, the Saturn opposition is considered more of the midlife transit, and that's not going to happen um, until Travis's early 40s. And then lastly, the Uranus opposition, which we're nowhere near yet, um, is another universal midlife transit. So Travis is just at the beginning of the midlife transit's getting kicked off with Pluto square Pluto. So I'm calculating that I know because he's 36, he's probably in Saturn square Saturn and Pluto square Pluto. So the next thing that I would do is I'm going to move the clock here by months at a time. That's how I track the transits. And I'm gonna go backwards in time to see when did Pluto first begin to square Saturn and oppose the moon. Now, a little bit on the orbs of influence. The orbs of influence that I use for personal transits, especially when we're looking at outer planetary alignments into the birth chart. Remember, the further out a planet is, the more rare the alignment is because the further out a planet is, the slower that it moves around the sun, the slower it moves around the solar system, therefore the slower it moves around the birth chart. So Pluto and Neptune, the farthest, outer planet transits, um, they're the slowest moving, so therefore they're the most rare to go through a Pluto or a Neptune transit. And the general guideline here is that the more rare it is, the more potent or powerful it is. Um, and then as we work our way in, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, those planets begin to move much faster because they're closer to the sun. And so they're, they're more common, they're more frequent. Um, but really, we're looking at all of the outer planets um, that what are considered the transpersonal planets, which are specifically Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. But Saturn is, is the bridge between the transpersonal planets and the personal inner planets. So I'm going to go backwards in time. And, oh, right, so the orbs of influence that I use for outer planet transits to the birth chart is three to five degrees. Some people might consider that wide. A lot of people use two to three and focus on the exactitude. However, in my decade of work and research, what actually seems to be happening is a three to five degree orb of influence. And let me share a little bit about the spiritual significance of this um, technique of the orb of influence, which is this. For me, when a planet begins to approach at the five degree mark, there is a very special window that opens up in our psyche, in our intuitive imagination, to receive the symbolic or archetypal messages and themes of what that transit's gonna be about for us. Now, this usually requires us to be more sensitive, have the ability to listen deeply, to sit in quiet contemplation and meditation, to receive those messages, and then of course to also have that archetypal eye, the ability to read the world symbolically, metaphorically, um, thematically, and to, to uh, glean the archetypal significance of the um, you know, more concrete particular events that are happening in our lives that make up our lives. So what I'm saying here is that at the five degree approaching or the influence of personal transits, there is a holographic intimation or a fractal opening of what it is that we can thematically expect to go through in the remaining transit, which by the time it gets to three degrees, full immersion, we're completely in the transit. There's no longer a sense of distance um, or, or therefore that kind of perspective that we can get when something's a little bit more removed or we have a little bit more distance to look at it, which is what's happening at the five degree mark. If we can imagine a wave coming in, the wave starts to come in slowly and then as it builds momentum and speed, it picks up 
in height and intensity, force and power, and then it moves out again. So the five degree orb is really like we see the wave coming in and there's things that are starting to pop up phenomenologically in our life that we're really starting to get activated. Little signifiers and events are starting to come in, but it's not full potency yet. It's not full power. We're not in a full immersion of uh, the transit yet. That's happening more at three degrees. And then it's really um, full immersion, two degrees, one degree, exactitude, you know, and then within that, there's always going to be this motion of planets stationing retrograde and direct passing back and forth over the natal chart. And a good guideline there is that whenever a planet stations direct or retrograde at the exact degree of your birth chart planet, there is a portal that opens with greater concentration. The veil is thin and more content, more data, more experience is siphoned through um, into our life. And so we want to really pay attention to when that happens. And then the transit goes um, out. And once it hits the three degree mark of separating from the natal position, um, we're starting to release. And by the time it gets to the five degree mark, between the three and five degree mark of separation, we are integrating, we are embodying, we are, you know, looking back at all of the lessons and the teachings and the experiences that we've gone through from the suffering to the joy. And we're going, wow, you know, look at what just happened over the past year, three years, five years, and really get that perspective of retrospective you know hindsight 2020 going oh that's what that was about look at what happened i understand now the ways that i um, was I, I developed and i grew and you know evolved and look at what happened there and so it's it's another moment of getting a little bit more distance from the transit uh, and being able to have that perspective to kind of intellectually integrate what was probably a very deeply embodied, visceral, physical, spiritual, emotional, and psychological process that you were immersed in for that period of time of that transit. And so the separating of the three to five degree mark helps us give us another window of that hindsight 2020 going, okay, you know, it's important that we take the time to live, embody, give form to, integrate into our life slowly, methodically, carefully, into practice, um, everything that we were given, all of the revelation and the insight and the experiences, um, all of the knowledge, we want to turn that into wisdom. And we need to do that by taking the time to actually embody the lessons and the teachings that came through. And that's really what starts to happen at the separating mark of the three to five degrees. So I would use that three to five degrees approaching and separating for all of the hard aspects or dynamic aspects, the conjunction, most definitely the opposition and even the square, but most definitely the conjunction and the opposition. For the trine and the sextile, um, I, I use the three degree orb of influence approaching and separating with it being very active from one to two degrees. I'm not going to get into minor aspects here in their orbs of influence. Um, as far as um, personal transits and the things that break that pattern would be the Saturn return. We would use a 15 to 20 degree orb of influence approaching and separating um, for the first Saturn return, the second Saturn return, and the third Saturn return happening at 30, 60, and 90, roughly. Um, we would also Saturn to itself in the square and opposition, we'd use a solidly seven to 10 degree orb of influence approaching and separating. The same would be true to any planets to itself. So the Uranus square, five to seven degree, um, the Uranus opposition, uh, which happens for everyone roughly between 40 and 45, I would use a 10 degree orb approaching and separating. And um, Pluto square Pluto, it's solidly five uh, degrees and uh, Neptune square Neptune solidly five degrees. And the, the same would be true for the opposition of those. Maybe you would see it, you know, five to eight, somewhere in there. Um, again, these are guidelines that are there to help you be able to see the data. And this was all um, 
collected and researched um, between myself and my colleagues uh, for me over the last decade and for them longer. So I welcome you to try this method on and see if it works for you. All right, let's start the practice now. So I'm going backwards in time to when Pluto got to five degrees approaching um, to the square to Saturn at 15 Libra. So what that means is that I am uh, gonna go back to 10 degrees Capricorn, which was, was years ago. So I'm just going backwards by month here and you can see the, pla the planets going backwards. And I'm looking for the first time that Pluto got to 10 Capricorn, which would be right. Just wanna make sure. So I always go a little bit past when it was at 10 and then here. So Pluto got to 10 degrees Capricorn in February of 2013. And um, that means Pluto began to square Travis's Saturn in February of 2013. And then I want to move forward by months to see when Pluto got to 12 Capricorn because that would be a five degree opposition uh, to Travis's natal moon at 17 Cancer. So I'm going to go ahead and see when did it get to 12, not yet, and then here, February of 2014, a year later, Pluto began to oppose Travis's natal moon. Um, so what else I do here is I actually, um, want to show you that how I write this down. So I'm going to pull up my uh, Word doc here and show you that um, these are the personal transits for Travis Deruta. The transiting planet always comes first whenever we're um, speaking. So Pluto Sun means always that the transiting Pluto in the sky is aspecting the natal sun. That's how we speak this language so that we don't have to say transiting Pluto's aspecting your natal sun. We can say, oh, your Pluto sun transit. So it's the shorthand for us astrologers to know the transiting planet is always spoken first because it's the one that's in motion, whereas the birth chart always stays. So I come here and I write down, um, let me do it like this. Uh, Pluto square Saturn and the dates of that are February uh, 2013 to we don't know yet and then also um, Pluto op opposite the moon which is also going to be a year later in 2014. So I'm writing it down like this and um, now I am going to go back to the chart and show you, here we go. Um, and so now I'm gonna move forward by months and I'm going to see that when Pluto gets to 19 Capricorn, that's when Pluto square Pluto began for Travis. And so I'm gonna write that down April of 2017, Pluto began to square Travis's natal Pluto, that midlife transit that happens for everybody around this age. Um, and so those are the only uh, three, no, actually there's one more. Um, Pluto is going to begin to trine Travis's Chiron Venus, which I would write as one, um, transit because they're within a degree you can see 25 and 26 Taurus they're within a degree so really that's just one transit I'm not going to write those down as separate transits and that would be when Pluto gets to 22 Capricorn which actually just recently happened so when Pluto gets to 22 Cap boom this month of March 2019 that begins uh, Pluto trine Chiron Venus. So those are going to be the only aspects of Pluto that I'm going to be looking at for the personal transit. So I'm going to keep going forward in time um, to see when do these transits end. So Pluto square Saturn is going to end when Pluto gets to 20 degrees. Pluto opposite the moon is going to end when it uh, is at 22 degrees. And then Pluto trine the Chiron Venus is 29 degrees. So um, what it is that's important here to look at, and this is all just 
practice. You're going to get this with time. When I'm doing this, let's say before a reading, this takes me 15 minutes, but here, because I'm breaking it down and explaining it all to you, it's obviously taking a lot longer than that. But this practice really only takes about 15 minutes once you get fluent in it. And the only way to do that is to do it a bunch of times. I've done this literally thousands of times by now. So it's just like you get into the rhythm and you can get a feel for the retrograde forward, the retrograde forward motion of all the planets. And I know that Pluto transits last approximately six years, Neptune five, Uranus three to four, Saturn one to two, Jupiter one month to a year. These are all based in the astronomy. Those things never change. I know those to be true. So it gives me a sense of the cosmic rhythm of the timing of these personal transits. And as astrologers, we need to know this. We need to feel into those rhythms. And then when we calculate the visual of the personal transits, we just get used to it by practicing it. Practice it, practice it, practice it. And what would take you an hour will take you 30 minutes and then will eventually take you 15. So I'm going forward in time and I see that Pluto is at 20 Capricorn in October of 2019, which is the end of the Pluto square Saturn. And then the Pluto opposite the moon. Okay, do you see here how Pluto comes back to 22 Capricorn? And so um, this would be uh, technically the end of the five degree opposition of Pluto to the moon. But what we want to take in in our systems view of astrology, right? A larger view. We want to take in the whole system. We see that in 2020, Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto are going to make a triple conjunction in Capricorn. And Jupiter in October of 2020 is going to be at 18 Capricorn. This is a one degree opposition to Travis's moon. This means that Jupiter's opposite Travis's moon, Jupiter and Pluto are in a four degree conjunction in the sky that's very tight for a world transit. So really it's still Jupiter, Pluto opposite the moon. And so I want to go forward in time to see Jupiter off of Travis's moon before I call the end of the Pluto moon transit. Okay. So I would go to here, December of 2020, uh, for the end of Pluto opposite the moon. Now that might seem like a little technicality, but I do feel that it's important for us to give ourselves and our clients the mo most realistic take on the months of when they can expect these things to happen. Of course, it's not a, you know, a, a one month it's on, the next month it's off. But generally speaking, I would say, you know, it's very safe to say Pluto opposite the moon will be felt by Travis until December of 2020. And that's helpful for a person to make meaning and relevance of their life events and also help them with the timing of decisions that they need to make knowing that this is happening. Okay. And then uh, let's keep going forward in time to get to the end of Pluto square Pluto, which is going to be 29 um, Capricorn. Um, I'd really just say probably zero Aquarius. You know, uh, once Pluto moves into Aquarius and it's out of Capricorn, that's when it's safe to say that it's the end of Pluto square Pluto. So here you can see that in February of 2024, Pluto uh, got to zero Aquarius, but I want to go forward in time to make sure that it didn't station retrograde and enter back into Capricorn one last time. And this is important to catch early on in the practice is we really want to make sure that we're going a few months past when we think the transit's done just to make sure that that planet doesn't station and go retrograde and continue the transit. And so in this case, it does. Pluto goes back to 29 Capricorn. The square to Pluto is still therefore happening. I go forward. And then when does it enter Aquarius? Finally, for the last time, uh, December of 2024 is the end of Pluto square Pluto. And then lastly, um, this would also mark the ending of Pluto trining the Chiron Venus three degree orb separation. I would just call it the same time of December of 2024. So I hope that you can get a sense of how I just did that. Um, one last thing to add into this piece is that a transit 
is active and that goes for world transits or personal transits from the very first moment that it enters the orb of influence to the very last moment that it leaves the orb of influence it is operative it is active it is significant to our life and life events the entire time that transit is operative and this is really important because a lot of astrologers will say well no you know, once it leaves the three degree mark, even if it comes back, then the transit's done and then it starts again. And I just don't see that to be true. I think that that's not how time works. I don't think that's how psyche works. Um, that to me is a much more kind of um, one version of a, of a much more masculine solar model. Um, first of all, that it's a tendency to leaning more towards um, literalism, separatism, and a kind of strict linear definition that, um, again, I don't think psyche or time operates in that way. I don't think things start and then they stop and then they start. I think they start. I think there's waves within the process. And I think that within that whole time, that process is activated. So um, transits are operative from the first moment they begin to the last moment they exit. And I think it's really important for us not to fixate on when they're exact. That's, it's relevant, it's significant, it's helpful to know, but sometimes the most powerful or significant events of our life don't happen when the transit's exact. It can happen at the three degree mark before, it can happen at the five degree mark after. That's not how psyche works. That's a much more, again, literal, concretized version of this process, which is actually deeply fluid, uh, deeply metaphorical and symbolic um, that, that for me that's too constrictive for psyche uh, for energy and for the archetypal realm so I really want to encourage you to see the transits being operative from the entire time they're in the orb of influence from the first moment they enter to the last moment they exit and to not overly fixate on exactitude um, I think this will actually help bring a greater ease and a widening of your experience so that more of life actually makes sense in a connective way. I find this actually to be really healing and helpful. So let me just go up to the um, image of writing out the transits one last time so you can get a visual of that. Um, so the end date for the Pluto square Saturn is going to be October 2019. The ending of uh, Pluto opposite the moon is going to be um, December of 2020. And then I want to put in the other one, which is uh, Pluto trine Chiron Venus one transit. And that one began in right now, March of 2019 and goes until December of 2024. So that's the visual of how I write out the transits. I'm not going to keep showing you this, but I would write this out all the way down from Pluto to Saturn and sometimes Jupiter. Um, maybe I'll show you one more time with Neptune just so you can see how I break that up. But that's that's how I write it out. Um, I usually write it out in shorthand with the glyph Pluto and the glyph of the square and the glyph of Saturn, but I can't do that here. So I'm showing you this way. All right, so, um, oh, did I not show you that here? Sorry, there we go. Now you can see it. That's what it looks like um, in the writing of it out. Okay, now let's go back to looking at the transits and check out Neptune. So I'm gonna go back to now and I see that Neptune is at um, 16 degrees of uh, Pisces. And so what do I notice right away? that Neptune is in a once in a lifetime conjunction with Travis's natal descendant at 17 Pisces. I say it's once in a lifetime because you can only get a um, conjunction of Neptune uh, as a personal transit once in your life. How do I know that? Because astronomically Neptune takes 164 years to go around the solar system, to go around the sun. Therefore it takes 164 years to go around the birth chart. That means that a conjunction of Neptune can only happen once in a lifetime, that actually you could go many lifetimes without experiencing a conjunction of Neptune to a certain part of your chart. The same is true for Pluto transits. 
Pluto takes 250 years to go around the solar system. Therefore, um, it's a once in a lifetime transit. Um, we can again go through many lifetimes without getting a conjunction or an opposition of a Pluto transit to the natal chart, to a certain part of the natal chart. Um, the same is true for Uranus. It's once um, goes around every 84 years. It's also once in a lifetime when we're talking about a conjunction or an opposition. Um, that would not be true for Saturn or Jupiter unless that person had a shorter lifespan. But if they live a long time, then you're gonna get multiple times of Saturn and Jupiter. Um, Saturn's every 29 years, Jupiter's every 12 years. So we wanna know the duration of the cycles that we're looking at astronomically to understand the relevance um, of, of the transit. The more rare, the more potent. Um, the more rare, the slower moving, the longer lasting. Um, the more frequent, the more common, the faster moving, and, um, and you know, the faster moving, the more frequent. So that's a helpful framework to use. Also, um, all planets that are outside of the sun, I'm sorry, outside of the Earth um, in relationship to the sun, so Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, uh, you can count Chiron in there as well. Um, the duration around the sun is always gonna be the duration around the birth chart. However, for planets inside of the Earth's orbit, Venus, uh, Mercury, and then uh, the moon is its own thing because it's obviously not um, orbiting the sun in the same way that it, you know, we, we calculate it orbiting the Earth every uh, 29 days, that um, those transits are, it takes a year for uh, Venus and Mercury and the sun to go around the chart, even though um, that's not the exact amount of time that it takes to go around the sun. So it's always good to, to know a bit of our astronomy so we can be grounded in this practice um, physically. So Neptune is conjunct the descendant. Um, I also see that it's in 120 degree trine to Travis's moon at 17 Cancer. Um, it is um, coming out of the square to his natal Mercury. I'm probably not gonna write that down. Um, I could if I wanted to. You know, sometimes I'll write down uh, personal transits that just happened, especially if I'm giving a reading to give context of you know, the last five years, this was happening. The last two years, this was happening. And so now what's happening in relationship to that makes sense in this way, et cetera. Um, I probably will write down Neptune squared Neptune just to give Travis a sense of that timing of that universal midlife transit. Um, let's see, is there anything else that I would want to consider here? I think that's good for now. So let's see when Neptune got within uh, five degrees approaching of Travis's natal descendant at 17 Pisces. That would be at 12. I'm going to go backwards in months again. And I go back in time and I want to see the very first time that Neptune got to 12. Okay, so it's right here in um, June of 2016. Neptune conjunct the descendant, June 2016. When did it begin to trine the moon? That's going to be a three degree orb because it's a trine, soft aspect, uh, confluent aspect. So that's going to be when Neptune got to 14. So I'm going to move ahead by months. When did it get to 14 for the first time? Right here, 14 Pisces, June of 2017. Neptune, trine moon, June 2017. Okay, now I'm going to move forward by months to see. Look at that. Neptune's really tight there. All of 2019 going back and forth uh, over the descendant and still really tight in 2020. So that's like really the heart of the transit. And then I want to see when does it finally get to 22 Pisces? Go a little past because I always want to make sure it doesn't come back. In this case, it does. And you see here, Neptune at 22 Pisces goes until um, December of 2022, conjunct the descendant. I'm going to go backwards in time um, to see when did it get to 20 for the last time. Be right here. December of 2021, trining, Neptune trining the moon. Okay, Neptune square Neptune. What's the orb of influence we use? Five degrees approaching and separating. So I'm gonna go backwards in time to when did Neptune first get to 20 degrees? Always go a little past to make sure. In this case, Neptune gets to 20 degrees Pisces. 
in May of 2020. That's a year from now. So that's good to know. It's one year from now. If I was counseling Travis, I would want to begin to prepare him mentally and spiritually for what could be some of the themes of this five-year transit, this universal midlife transit. When we see a transit coming a year or two ahead, we want to be able to prepare our clients to start to orient themselves to what's happening because what's happening right now is deeply connected to what's happening then. Time is linear from this perspective of being human in this, uh, in this current uh, density and dimensional reality. However, we know that that in, in another case isn't true. And so everything that's happening right now in a sense is not just a consequence of the past, but it's also a being pulled forward from the future. And those are our future transits. And so Neptune square Neptune is beginning to pull things out of Travis that are then going to actually be events that occur in his life once the transit begins in May of 2020. And so I'm going to go forward in time to see when does Neptune um, leave Pisces and enter into Aries and stay there. That would be the end of Neptune square Neptune. So I see that Neptune's at 29 Pisces, goes into zero Aries. Does it go back? Yes, it goes back to 29 Pisces in November of 2025. So I'm going to go forward and boom, there. Neptune is at zero Aries. Now, you can see, we once again have this example of Saturn and Neptune are in a tight one degree conjunction in February of 2026. And Saturn is still square Travis's natal Neptune by four degrees. So I would say that Neptune square Neptune is still happening because the Saturn conjunct Neptune world transit is a field of energy. And that field of energy is operative and activating the natal Neptune. So I actually want to see when does Saturn get off the Neptune to find the end of Neptune square Neptune. And it actually happens pretty quickly here. So really, we're just talking about the difference of a couple months, which, you know, in one hand, is it that significant when we're looking at a five, six year transit? Mm, maybe, maybe not. But, you know, I think it does matter. So I'm going to say March of 2026 is the end of uh, Neptune, square Neptune. So let me show you one last time here um, the Word document so that you can see um, how I would write this out. I'll pull this up. And so what I would do is I would take a couple spaces and mark the beginning. Neptune, conjunct, descendant, that's the shorthand for descendant. The time period for that began in June of 2016 and it goes until December of 2022. And then Neptune trine moon goes from uh, June of 2017 until December of 2021. And then uh, Lastly, Neptune square Neptune. Okay, that begins next year in May of 2020 and it goes until March of 2026. Okay, so you get the gist of how I'm writing that out. And again, I would then write out Uranus and then down here Saturn. And then if I felt like doing Jupiter for the year or the next two years, I would. So that's that. Okay, we don't need to look at that sheet again. That's just for your visual reference of like, what does it actually look like? And remember, the transiting planet always comes first. Okay, go back to the chart. And now that we've gotten the hang of this, I'm going to move a little bit faster. So now I'm going to go to Uranus. I see that right now transiting Uranus is at zero Taurus. It's just moved into Taurus for the first time in approximately 80 years. So what do I see from this? Transiting Uranus is currently exactly opposite Travis's natal Jupiter at zero Scorpio. It's also been opposite his natal Pluto at 24 Libra. It is in an exact 60 degree sextile to his natal sun. Um, it was trining his natal Neptune. It no longer is. And is there anything else I want to include? It's going to be a while before it conjuncts Venus Chiron. Now, I might want to map out the Uranus opposition and the timing of that just because it's such a significant event. Again, a universal transit that we all go through from 40 to 45. Travis is 36. Maybe I want to plant that seed 
especially if he doesn't already know about it, or if he does, to give him the timing of that to say, like, this is the next pretty significant life time period for you developing, you know, in a way since the Saturn return. I mean, Carl Jung said that, you know, the 40s is when we individuate. Now, when we look at that astrologically, what happens then? The Uranus opposition. The Uranus opposition is such a special time because it's the time where our our daemon, that which we were seeded into this life to bring into the world um, in our own creative, brilliant way, is meant to come out in a bigger, fuller, more developed, more mature expression. So it's a time period where there's a lot of upheaval and a lot of radical change and breakthrough, and it's a very big rebirth and it rebirth energy. Um, It's the movement of the first half of our life into our second half of our life. But it's also a time period where we tend to um, deeply individuate even more from our family and society to bring out our unique gifts. Think Aquarius, you know, our unique individual gifts. And so this is an extremely significant time period. It's a little ways off the horizon, uh, on the horizon for Travis, but it's coming. And so I might want to write that down for him just so I can give him a sense of, hey, this is when this is coming. So let's go backwards in time. When did Uranus get to 19 Aries? Because that's when it began to oppose Pluto. Boom. For the first time right here in June of 2015. That marks the beginning of Uranus opposite Pluto. When did it begin to oppose Jupiter? When it got to 25 Aries right here, May of 2017. When does it begin to sextile the sun? When it gets within three degrees, which is right here, shortly after when it begins to oppose Jupiter. Uranus sextiles the sun in June of 2017. Now, why are these two transits virtually happening at the same moment? Uranus opposing Jupiter and Uranus sextiling the sun? Because when we go back to Travis's birth chart, he's born with an exact sun trying Jupiter. That means that when his sun gets aspected, so does Jupiter. And in this case, Uranus is opposing the Jupiter and sextiling the sun. Okay, now I want to keep going forward in time to see the end of this. Uranus ends the opposition to Pluto, I would say, here, June of 2019. I know that that's, um, you know, more like a seven degree mark, but I think especially when we have a planet in the birth chart that's near the end of a sign like 24 Libra is, we want to make sure that the transiting planet that's aspecting it is going into the next sign before we really say that that transit's done when we're looking at the hard aspects of the conjunction opposition and square. So I think it's safe to say June, 2018, or I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong year. The Uranus goes back into Aries and then, I would say boom, April of 2019, excuse me, when Uranus finally moves out of Aries into Taurus. See, so you got to catch that and keep going forward and making sure that doesn't station retrograde. Um, and so here, I would say next month, April of 2019, Uranus is done in the opposition to Pluto. When is it done in the opposition to Jupiter? Here, it's probably done sextiling the sun, I would say April 2020, because it's a smaller orbit influence, but really because it's active activating Jupiter. We want to make sure, does it come back to five? No. So yeah, the transits, it's the same time period. So here, Uranus ends the opposition to natal Jupiter and sextile the sun, April of 2020. Okay. Uh, Let's go forward in time so I can show you that 10 degree orb approaching and separating for the Uranus opposition that I mentioned is, um, different orb of influence that I would than I would usually use for Uranus transits. So I want to see what happens here with Uranus. It enters into Travis's ninth house and it begins to conjunct his natal Chiron in June of 2023. So it's going to begin to activate the beginning of that stellium. So the Chiron Venus conjunction at 25, 26 Taurus is uh, activated in June of 2023. And then, um, I would say that it's safe to say that that's also the beginning of Travis's Uranus opposition. So I would say here at this 11 degree approaching opposition of Uranus at 20 degrees Taurus to his natal Uranus at one Sag is the beginning of the Uranus opposition. So June, 2023, that's only four years from now. 
that's going to come around any moment. And I would want Travis to begin to prepare, you know, just to know that that's coming and he can orient his, the rhythms of his life and the decisions he's making as best as any of us humans can with our limited knowledge and place in the cosmos to begin to say, okay, that's coming. Um, and uh, there's different ways I would counsel him around that, but uh, this is more focused on techniques. So we're not going to get into that here. And we would go ahead in time and we would see that Uranus would begin to conjoin his natal Mercury in July of 2026. The opposition is in full gear. And I'd say that the opposition is done. You know, maybe it would be done here here march of 2030 now you're saying oh my gosh you're trying to tell me his your honest opposition is six years well yes and no yes because travis is born with chiron venus remember opposite uranus he's born with chiron venus and mercury all opposite uranus so really once the chiron and venus are activated his uranus is activated and as long as his mercury is activated so is his uranus so I would say that definitely the Uranus opposition would go until March of 2030 because it's still in a five degree conjunction to his natal Mercury, but really he's just going to keep going because it's still exactly conjunct his midheaven. Uranus at 14 degrees Gemini, his midheaven's 15, almost 16. So really, you know, Travis is going to be really going strong with Uranus conjunct his midheaven, which is different than the opposition um, to his natal Uranus, but it's going to be a very big decade, a whole decade of big Uranian energy for Travis. Once in a lifetime conjunctions to Chiron, Venus, Mercury, and the Midheaven, that once in a lifetime opposition of the universal midlife transit, and then it's going to eventually uh, conjoin his natal sun, north node, and moon. So, you know, it's getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I would want to take that in as a counseling astrologer and be like, that's a humongous decade of once in a lifetime consecutive Uranus conjunctions for Travis. Okay, so um, let me briefly do Saturn and then we're gonna wrap this up. Okay, so transiting Saturn's at 18 Capricorn. That means it's square his natal Saturn, opposing his natal moon, and it will eventually trine his Chiron Venus. So same transits that we were looking at for Pluto because Saturn and Pluto are conjunct in the sky. That also means that Saturn is going to begin to square his natal Pluto and then eventually is Jupiter. So when did Saturn square Saturn begin? I would use a solid five to 10 degree or approaching. Um, when would I intuitively say that Saturn square Saturn began? Why am I going so far backwards in time? Because I was looking at Pluto. Uh, here we go. I would say here. Saturn square Saturn began in March of 2018. And Saturn opposing the moon began here. January of 2019. See when it gets to 12 Capricorn. And then Saturn begins to square Pluto uh, next month, April of 2019. And we can see here that um, Saturn and Pluto are conjunct in the sky for the first time since Travis was born with the Saturn-Pluto conjunction. So Travis was born with Saturn and Pluto in conjunction 1982. They were conjunct 1981 to uh, 84, part of 85. Uh, here we are 35 years later, and now Saturn and Pluto are conjunct again. Saturn and Pluto conjoin, and the world transits approximately every 35 years. That's a certain rhythm of the cosmic clock of our solar system if we look at the structural poetics of our um, solar system astronomically. So Saturn and Pluto are conjunct for the first time since Travis was born. They also happen to be in a 90-degree square to 
uh, Travis's natal Saturn Pluto. This is an extremely significant time whenever we're born with an archetypal aspect configuration in our birth chart and it happens in the world transits there's a mutual activation of that complex in our psyche and in the world and it's a time where there's just a very strong resonance of that energy it's very much permeating and saturating our consciousness and our experience both inner and outer also really important to remember here that transits are trans individual meaning that it's not just about you as an individual person or an individual psyche some atomistic separate ego entity no it's affecting the whole field around you it's not just your inner life it's not just your work or your relationships but it's other people it's the experience of the world or environment around you it's your family all of these things are part of the field of these personal transits for you so if transits are trans individual they're not just happening to you if you are in a relationship they're happening for that relationship um, whoever you share home with they're going to be feeling those transits as well. It's the environment and the world around you as much as it is yourself and your inner life. Um, also, uh, we would go backwards in time and we'd see that Saturn in the square to itself. I would say it's safe to say actually November of 2020. And that's just again because Jupiter comes into this rare triple conjunction of Jupiter, Pluto, Saturn in Capricorn. So we want to make sure that Jupiter's off the Saturn and the moon before we say that this transit's really done. So Saturn, moon, I would say, okay, you know, I would call it here. I'd say, you know, Saturn, moon is probably realistically done February 2020, but he might feel some leftover stuff of it because of Jupiter there until November 2020. It's a half year difference. I don't think it's going to be super strong in that last half year. I think there just might be some residual energy. And that's how I would feel that. It's like, feel that with me. It's just residual. It's just residual. Okay. And then Saturn, Trine, Chiron, Venus. I would want to look at that. Um, are there any closing remarks that I want to make? I know that we went just on a big technical journey. I was putting out a lot of numbers. Uh, hopefully you're able to get the visual of it at the Trust Psyche YouTube channel. Um, again, this was a special stream because it's part of the Deep in Your Astrological Practice course. Uh, that course actually isn't uh, technically oriented. This is one of two technical um, segments of the course. The whole course is really actually focused on the meaning. So in today, uh, in the course, what I would have been doing instead of talking about all these numbers, um, and timing is I would have said like, so what can we expect from Saturn, Saturn? What can we expect um, with Pluto, Venus? And going into the meaning of that and how do we interpret that? And how does that show up in our life? So that's what that course is about. But this one section of the course is to help people actually do the personal transit practice because it's such a profound part of the spiritual practice of astrology, personal use, and then of course, professional use. How do we actually give our clients a realistic sense of the timing of these things? And again, from my last decade of work and research and, you know, calculating thousands of charts and doing this thousands of times, this is what I've seen to, to be most true. Um, I also want to state here that Trust Psyche is a growing astrological community. We are comprised of hundreds of astrologers all around the world who just have this shared love and passion for uh for waking up in this world in the most meaningful way that we can with the little and precious time that we have here. I hope that you'll join our community. If you're not already a part of it, we would love for you to come be a part of the dialogue to come like us and follow us on Facebook at Trust Psyche, uh, to subscribe to the Trust Psyche YouTube channel and to my blog at trustpsyche.com. It's always an honor and a pleasure to share any of the teachings and wisdom and knowledge that I have with you. I hope that this technical piece has been helpful. Lastly, I'll say that uh, I will be offering a transit astrology course uh, sometime in the next um, uh, year or two. My next course is going to be happening uh, this summer. It's uh, going to be counseling astrology. It's going to be a vocational training or advanced seminar for people who are actually professional astrologers and giving readings and for me to help guide um, and share all of the skills and experience that I've had um, doing readings, everything from 
how to sit with clients, how to read uh, certain charts and aspects, and then also the business side of things, how to run a successful business, how to run a successful practice. So that course is next, uh, Counseling Astrology, but Transit Astrology uh, is going to also be happening where we won't be just focusing on the technique but uh, also on the meaning and interpretation of how we psychologically develop over the course of our life. Thank you so much for being here with me on Stream 8 and Personal Transits. Again, this is just a reminder that the spiritual significance uh, is in the technique itself. And the technique is part of what grounds us. It's 10% of the practice, but that's how we become fluent in this language and this discipline. And it is a practice. And the more we practice it, the easier it becomes. And so I hope that you will take this practice and to all my students, I hope you will take this practice and use it strongly uh, as much as you can because it will take you very far. It's taken me very far. And so for what it's worth, uh, I hope it does for you as well. Thank you so much. It's an honor and a blessing. Take care everyone.